In the previous module, we developed the one predictor linear regression model, where we were describing an individual score on y as a function of the y-intercept, beta sub zero, plus beta one times xi, so the slope in the model times the score on x for an individual, plus e sub i, the individual error. Now individual error, like always, is a representation of the degree to which individuals differ from what is predicted by the model. I left you with the insight that what is really predicted by our model is the mean of all people at a particular level of x. So error in our model is the degree to which a person differs from all the people at that person's level of x. Now in our sample, the residual will simply be the degree to which a person's actual y score differs from what is predicted by the model. So when we actually form a line of fit, we'll get a line in our sample and the degree to which a person's actual score differs from what this line would predict for them makes up the E sub i's. Now we'll use the E sub i's in our sample to make an estimate of the population epsilon. Specifically, we'll be interested in the variance of error in the population. Just like before with our linear models, the variance of error gives us an idea about how stable our regression estimates will be. So we'll need to estimate sigma square in the population on the basis of these E sub i's. Now the estimation of sigma square will carry forward in much the same way it did in our previous linear models. That is, the sums of squares for error will be formed on the basis of the deviation between the actual y scores, the y i's, minus the y hat i's squared. We can also write this just like before as the sum of the E sub i squares. Now, mean square error in our model will be formed on the basis of these sums of squares error. Specifically, sums of squares error divided by n minus two, the degrees of freedom. Remember, we're estimating two parameters for this model, that is, b sub zero and b sub one. So we're using up two degrees of freedom in order to estimate error. So the degrees of freedom for error is simply n, the number of individuals, minus two and mean square error in our model will be our best unbiased estimator of the population variance. Now note that this variance estimate depends on the assumption that error in the population is the same at every level of x. This is known as the assumption of homoscedasticity. That's just a big word for really a simple concept, that variance or error doesn't depend on the level of x. This is the analogous assumption in regression to the homogeneity of variance assumption when we have mean structure models. Again, the assumption of homoscedasticity simply states that the variance around the line in the population, that is how much individuals differ from that average for every individual at their level of x, that that variance does not change for different levels of x. We'll come back to testing this assumption later on, but notice why the assumption of homoscedasticity is important. It's important because if the error in the population doesn't depend on the level of x, then every residual in our model could be used equally to form our estimate of sigma square. Now that we have a way of estimating error in the population, we can perform hypothesis tests on the pieces of our model. Specifically, in regression, there are several different types of inferences we might be interested in making. The first and probably most important are the tests of our model parameters. The first is the test of B1. That is a question of if in the population, the regression slope is different from zero. Remember that we can form a sample estimate that is different than the population parameter. In fact, that will always happen and that's sampling error. So even if B1 in our sample, the slope in our sample is different from zero, that's not necessarily good evidence that in the population, the slope is different from zero. So our test of B1 is really a test of beta one and whether we have evidence in the population that beta one differs from zero. Now, take a second to think about why this is important. In our previous example, we were looking at the regression relationship between score on an exam and the number of hours study. If in the population, the regression slope is actually zero, well, that would mean that there is no effect of studying on average on the final exam percentages of students. So testing the slope is probably of most interest because it is what is really capturing the effect. Now we can also form a test of B0. And that's the question of, in the population, is the y-intercept different from zero? Now this test is usually of less interest than the test of the slope. 
the test of the slope is really the test of the effect of x on y. Whereas the test of b0 is just a test of whether when you have none of x, do you have anything different than zero of y. In our previous example, this would be a test of if somebody studies zero hours, do we think they have a score different from zero? We can be pretty sure that somebody who studies zero hours probably will do different from zero in the population. But occasionally this is the test of interest and we can form our test in much the same way as the test of B1. Now in addition to the test of parameters, by having an estimate of error, we can also do several types of prediction. Specifically, a confidence interval for the conditional mean of y at xi. This is a question of where do we believe the mean is for all people with a particular level of x. So this will be a point estimate plus or minus some interval. So this is really a confidence interval around the mean of all people of y at a given x. Now there's another type of prediction that is sometimes used, and this is a confidence interval for y for an individual at a particular xi. So this is where do we believe the score is for a particular person at a particular level of x. So again, a point estimate plus an interval. This is a slightly different confidence interval because in the first confidence interval, the one for the conditional mean of y, we're talking about an interval for predicting where the mean is of all people. The second confidence interval is really an interval for where we think individual scores are lying. Now we won't spend too much time on the prediction intervals. I'll show you how to produce these in jump, but we'll spend most of our time in this module talking about the tests of our parameters. And there will be two different ways we'll talk about approaching these tests. Now, the first are sampling distribution known tests. And it turns out we'll be able to use the t-tests and the logic of t-tests we discussed before. Now, the second way of analyzing these is using the analysis of variance and general linear tests. So these are f-test approach that in essence work the same way as our previous linear models. We'll be partitioning the variance in y into one part that's due to error and another part that's due to the predictability of the line. We'll start in the next video with sampling distributions known and the t-tests.